For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tim. Uh, I've been at the center for, gosh, 17, 18 years now. I must admit, this is my first ever webinar. So those of you who are my patients, um, please don't make fun of me when you see me in the office. My surgical skills, I promise, are way better than my technological skills. Um, really, the whole purpose of tonight's talk is to give folks who are interested some insight into outpatient total joint replacement, sort of where we've been, where we're going, things they might expect, and I'll, I'll kind of cover that. Um, hopefully, you just get a little bit of information, and at the end of this, we can do a question and answer session. Um, normally, I'm used to fielding questions live and get to interact with you, so this will be a little, little change of pace. Um, before we even get started, I want to thank um, Jamie, who was on earlier. She and Jenny King keep the center um, and the patients we have that we get to treat really in tune with keeping us sort of tech savvy and giving you folks a lot of content on our website, a lot of really good educational um, videos and um, er everything that they do sort of has gotten us to join uh, 2021. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't have a lot of uh, things like we're doing tonight. Um, also, Deb Rogers, who's at, at the end of this, going to probably field more questions than I will. She has been probably the biggest driver in helping some of the surgeons who had a vision of being able to do joint replacements as outpatients. Um, she was integral into developing the program. And to this day, she really is sort of the key key feature in, in everything we do with respect to our joint replacements. Um, also, Cami Gilstrap who isn't with us tonight. She is essentially the director of our surgery center and our surgery center staff. Uh, without them, the, the vision that many of us had years ago of bringing outpatient total joints to this community would never have happened. So um, if you ever do get a total joint at the center or the surgery center, Cascade Surgery Center, really those folks are the ones that are as responsible as the surgeons themselves. Um, so with, with that, I'll try to go through this and do the best I can um, from a technological standpoint, see if I can advance slides. So what are we gonna talk about tonight? Um, tonight we're gonna talk about what is a joint replacement. Um, this may be basic for some of you. A lot of you listening probably already have joint replacements. What's the history of joint replacements like that uh, previously joint replacements have been traditionally hospital based surgical procedures. How in the world did we get them to an outpatient arena. Um, the technological and medical advances maybe that have led to this specifically I think a lot of folks are going to be interested who's maybe a candidate and maybe who isn't a candidate for outpatient joint replacement. And then what would you, what would you expect if you're going to prepare for a joint replacement maybe in the hospital versus the outpatient setting, what one might expect from the day of surgery, the day after surgery, what's the recovery like from a joint replacement and even specifically an outpatient uh, joint replacement. And then I wanna leave plenty of time and be respectful of um, people's time to get to some question and answer uh, sessions. And if I don't answer your questions within the talk or I can't get to them later, I'm imagining that Jamie probably has a way for us to get uh, your answers, um, get answers to you. So with that being said, I thought we'd start with just why do people get joint replacements? What are joint replacements? The best analogy I share with a lot of my patients, some of my patients are probably laughing. If, if all of our joints in the body are coated with Teflon, and for those of us, uh, we don't have Teflon, we have articular cartilage. But if you scraped away a Teflon pans coating, that would be a very good analogy for what happens in arthritis. Most of the joint replacements we do in the United States are due to osteoarthritis, or a wearing away of the cartilage. And you can see the rusted pan down below that looks like a lot of the pans in my kitchen. Um, but people also get inflammatory arthritis, so things like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. Um, some people get arthritis, unfortunately, as a result of accidents. So. They will sustain trauma, fractures that involve the knee joint, the shoulder joint, the hip joint, and these will lead to an earlier arthroplasty or joint replacement. And then some folks um, are born with rare genetic conditions or deformities of limbs that lead to abnormal wear patterns, and these joints uh, oftentimes need to be replaced earlier. And remember, we generally do joint replacements for patients' pain and quality of life. Um, we try not to do joint replacements so people can just play maybe one specific sport, 
but we want to improve their overall quality of life. And oftentimes it's a last resort to being able to do so. So we'll get away from the pan analogy and we'll go to what does arthritis look like? Um, I'll try to see if I can do some fancy stuff here. If you can see my, my pen or the spotlight here. So articular cartilage is the white stuff that coats the bones, the tips of the bones, if you will. Specifically tonight, we're gonna focus on the knee, but obviously it's in our shoulders, our hips, our ankles. So when you lose the coating at the end of the bone, as you can see early stage arthritis and middle stage arthritis and then end stage arthritis um, over on the edge, the joint starts to hurt more, the joint becomes more inflamed. We lose normal joint space. A lot of you folks have maybe been told you have, or you have friends who have told you they have bone on bone arthritis. That really comes from this, this X-ray appearance where this person has normal joint space remaining and what lives in that black space is the cartilage, right? And when we lose that, the loss of joint space leads to pain and stiffness and swelling. And then we end up potentially with a joint replacement. So next slide, uh, the next several slides are really just pictures. I wanted to show folks who maybe have never seen them or maybe you've seen them, but wanted more, more pictures of uh, what's a, what, what type of joint replacements can be done as an outpatient. Um, what are the different types of joint replacements, period? So a lot of people ask us about partial knee replacements. These three pictures demonstrate what a partial knee replacement looks like. Um, the one on the left is a unicompartmental knee replacement. The one in the middle is a patellofemoral joint replacement. And then the one on the far, my screen's far right, is actually a, what they call a bicompartmental partial knee replacement. So you've replaced the inner part and the part behind your kneecap. So that's an example of a partial knee replacement. And I think many of you are familiar with what a total knee replacement looks like. Um, a lot of patients have maybe the misconception that when we do a knee replacement, we kind of lop off the ends of the bone and everything is metal. I think a better analogy is to think of like capping a tooth where we're really just covering the ends of the bone after we shave off the disease cartilage. So very minimal bony loss, where we try to do very minimal bony loss when we're doing specifically knee replacements. So this is an example of a total knee replacement. And then a hip replacement, which I no longer do, but a lot of my partners do great hip replacements. You can see it's the ball and socket that go, uh, that get diseased. And when we lose the cartilage on the ball and socket, we put in the artificial hip implant you see on your right, which has a stem and a cup. So that's what a hip replacement looks like. And those are done as outpatients as well. And then uh, some of us do shoulder replacements as well. And these can be done as outpatients. And you can see what a shoulder looks like when it on an x-ray, when it loses its cartilage, you get bone on bone arthritis there with bone spurs. And then you can replace the ball and the socket with metal and plastic with a shoulder replacement as well. And I suspect there will be an upcoming webinar on outpatient shoulder replacements by one of my partners, probably Dr. Jacobson coming up. So that's a teaser. Um, so what are, what are alternatives? I mean, we're, here we are talking tonight about joint replacements, but generally most conservative surgeons, we want our patients to try to maintain their quality of life without surgery. So we're going to try to recommend things such as low impact exercise, such as biking and swimming. Those are to if I can get my patients to participate in, I love it. Um, we want, we hope that they can maintain or achieve a healthy weight that will help pain and quality of life. We certainly encourage routine stretching and strengthening, um, anti-inflammatory treatments topically, orally. These may be very beneficial. Some patients may not be able to take anti-inflammatories or it may not be recommended by their primary care doctors. So obviously we may have to adapt some of these treatments. Other people get a lot of relief from injections around the knee and we can talk. I try to stay away from specifics of injections, but there are many types of injections and we have a, some good literature and handouts at the center if people are interested in learning more about injection therapies 
bracing, other assistive devices. So even in some of our more elderly folks, using a walker or a cane can be very beneficial. And the use of a physical therapist um, and their expertise in maintaining mobility can be very helpful to try to perhaps put off a joint replacement or prolong the life of your current joint. So let's dig into a little bit of the history of joint replacements. Um, attempts at joint replacements, when I was preparing this talk, it, you could give a, a five hour talk on just the sort of the like, the, the history of joint replacements. And on the far left, you see an old hinged knee joint. And today on the right, you see a modern knee joint actually put in one just like that a few hours ago. Um, that is a non-cemented knee replacement that the bone grows into that knee replacement. Really though, modern knee replacements sort of credited um, primarily out of HSS in the 1970s, a hospital in, in New York famous for its orthopedic program. Um, and then continuous design improvements throughout the next 40 years and even moving up to robotic partial knee replacements and then full knee replacements up to where we are today in 2021. Um, you know, attempts back in the 1800s consisted of everything. It was very common to try to replace an arthritic or destroyed joint by putting in soft tissue, I, I, even things such as pig bladders and cellophane type um, devices to try to maintain um, sort of a smooth surface between the bones. Obviously, these didn't fare too well. And where we are today, we're uh, certainly uh, doing a little bit better than that. Um, found this, uh, an old picture of St. Charles Hospital. So Traditional knee replacement, even in the 1990s when I was training, this was always a hospital-based operation. And patients, even today in other, in, in many countries, stay four to 10 days, nights in a hospital. And the early focus back then was on pain management. And we probably didn't really emphasize enough the mobilization of patients and physical therapy. We sort of kept them in bed and gave them a lot of pain medicine. And then we started to learn, of course, the complications of immobility um, made our joint replacements probably less successful. So we, we started noticing that the patients, the longer they stayed in bed, the more trouble they had with their pain. Perhaps the more blood clots we'd see after surgery, the more cases of pneumonia and constipation. So it was very, it was pretty clear in the 1980s, 1990s, early 2000s that if we can get patients a joint replacement and get them up and get them moving, their pain actually was better. They did better and they had way fewer complications. So instead of staying seven to 10 nights in a hospital, really um, traditional knee replacements have moved way down in that time, in that time frame. Um, frequently back in those days, almost always, it was a general anesthetic and the emphasis was on um, IV pain medicine. So uh, many of you maybe have had joint replacements years ago where we used to use pain pumps and patients would have IV pain medicine that they would pretty much 24 seven be able to kind of pump um, IV pain medicine in. We used to leave catheters uh, to numb nerves, uh, to deaden the nerves. Um, we used a lot of drains. We used indwelling catheters, bladder catheters, um, things that just sort of slowed patients recovery because Again, at the time, it was one way to manage some of the some of the problems around getting a joint replaced. Not that anybody wants to see pictures of drains and catheters, but there they are. Um, so modernization modernization of knee replacements really, in the last five, 10 years, the emphasis, and we actually get better results by getting our patients up and moving and getting them out of the hospital environment. So early mobilization, less general anesthetics, less opioid pain medication, an emphasis on multimodal pain control. And we can talk about that. Um, we, we are fortunate in town to have a wonderful anesthesia group that are experts in providing regional anesthetics and nerve blocks that work very well. And then an emphasis on cold compression devices to get rid of your swelling, which is one of the main problems with pain. And I'm not sure if you folks can see the screen, maybe you have my, my face up there, but compression stockings and elevation are going to be key to the recovery specifically from a knee replacement. So, so what made us transition then from even a hospital one to two days to outpatient? Well, a lot of patients started demanding it. Um, patients realized that they could do this and they'd rather be at home than in a hospital. 
Um, perhaps if you're going to be uncomfortable, you'd rather be uncomfortable in your own home than at a hospital. So initially, even back in the 1990s, lots of places across the country in very small numbers would take the youngest and healthiest candidates and do hip and knee replacements as outpatients. Frequently, those patients would stay in a setting for up to 23 hours. And of course, it, it does provide a dramatic cost reduction to our overall healthcare system. Insurance and Medicare estimated even in 2014 that for hospital-based joint replacements, costs average forty dollars to $50,000. And those costs are cut in half when we can minimize surgical stay and perform those procedures as an outpatient. Um, and we can talk more about the volume of knee replacements done in the United States or hip replacements and how much money this in general can save our, our current healthcare system and do so safely and effectively. So hopefully that's, so what, so when we did this, of course, as patients, you all want to know what are, what are the results? So, and this, this number is even old now, COVID has dramatically changed this and we can talk about that, but roughly all, roughly about 10% estimated of all knee replacements now are being performed on an outpatient basis. And again, I suspect you'll see that number go dramatically up as numbers come in from 2020 in 2021. Now what is partially allowed for this is Medicare, and I will try to avoid sort of politics, but Medicare has had a list of procedures that you can and cannot do outside a hospital. And recently total knee replacements have been allowed to be done at surgery centers and total hips this year are allowed to be done. And then next year total shoulders and reverse shoulders will be allowed to be done and pretty soon that Medicare list that dictates what can be done in a surgery center in a hospital will likely go away and vanish. I believe estimates were at 2024, 2025. So as you can imagine, the numbers that will now be able to be done in surgery centers will dramatically increase. So obviously patient safety was the primary concern so many studies have now been published specifically in the last five years. And I just have a few of them listed down below a series of up to a thousand patients, over a thousand patients. So we oftentimes in these studies are seeing better early pain scores, range of motion scores. We're seeing patients report excellent experiences that they would do again and duplicate. Um, uh, Aaron Hoffman had a huge study that uh, demonstrated this can be done safely with no deaths and very low reoperation rates. And those are really, we may be a little bit of a slow adapter in Bend, Oregon, but I think the surgeons here were very um, concerned about safety rates and complication rates and wanting to make sure that we could do this safely for the, the population of Central Oregon. So again, why the switch and what changed here? We Several of us were interested in this dating back to basically 2009, 2010, 2012, as it was being done across the country. So we began a lot of research into, is it safe? How are people doing this? Some of us took um, site visits to various places across the country that were doing this effectively and safely. And then we tried to draw specifically, even again, a lot of help from Deb Rogers and Cami Gilstrap, who I've mentioned, and our anesthesia director, um, Mike Hatch, trying to really hone in what are the best practices and what would work best in Bend, Oregon. We really did wait, um, maybe somewhat to the detriment, uh, but we wanted to wait until we had really good safety data to proceed. And again, we were sort of pushed honestly by, by our patients. So we've developed and evolved some of the current pathways and programs, and we continue to do so and look critically at our results. Um, again, we started very conservatively, and I can remember when, when we would do one total joint a month in our surgery center as an outpatient. That was a, that was a busy month. Now, on average, we're doing more than 30 a month and um, are slowly seeing, again, that rise uh, steadily. Oops. Um, so what, what is, again, what, what are some other things that you might be interested about? What's allowed us to do this instead of keeping you 10 nights and, um, you know, having you cruise around in a wheelchair after this? Well, a lot of this has to do with our anesthesia colleagues. Um, the use of being able to do short acting spinal anesthetics. 
So we don't have a lot of the general anesthetics that really can be hard, especially on elderly folks, um, waking up quickly and being able to work with physical therapy. Um, the use of ultrasound guided nerve blocks that is made that have made our nerve blocks safer, more effective and more efficient. Um, the use of same day physical therapy. So um, it, it was not uncommon, even when I first came to Bend, Oregon, when we would do a joint replacement, it would most of the time our patients weren't seen by physical therapists the same day. Now, hospital or here, we're going to make sure that a physical therapist, if at all possible, works with our patients no matter what. Um, at a surgery center, one huge advantage is we have one-on-one -on -one nursing. So when a patient comes out from a knee replacement at an, in an outpatient facility, they're going to have a nurse. The, anesthesia, the anesthesiologist is going to come out and deliver them to a nurse who's really an expert at helping them get through the process throughout the day. Um, so we can administer medication very effectively and only when necessary. Um, certainly less invasive surgical te techniques makes this operate, makes total knees, total shoulders, total hips, less painful for the patient. And the use of robotics may again lead into that. And below is a picture of a spinal anesthetic being administered and the Mako robot that we have at Cascade Surgery Center. So um, one of the cooler things about uh, us being in Central Oregon was the ability for Cascade Surgery Center to actually procure a Mako robot. Um, and many of my partners use this regularly and routinely. Um, we did uh, two of them today. Um, it, we were, I believe, one of the first centers on the West Coast uh, as a surgery center to, to get a, a Mako robot. And again, this has some potential benefits maybe smaller incisions, less trauma to the patient. It may, improve, it may improve alignment of the replacement. And all of this may speed up early range of motion and recovery and cause less pain for the patient. Um, uh, again, some of the other medical advances, the use of um, different drugs that help limit blood loss certainly uh, has come about. The use, I had mentioned multimodal pain control. So, Back in, the, back in the day when I first trained, it was almost all opioids. Now, preoperatively, the patients receive Tylenol, um, an anti-inflammatory. Postoperatively, we use muscle relaxants. We probably try to minimize opioid um, uh, pain medication. And we start physical therapy right away with an ice machine on at basically all times and that leg elevated. Also, a follow-up, especially in other parts of the country, and I suspect we will adapt this pretty pretty effectively over the next several years. Just to use to be able to check in on a patient, I think COVID has even driven this, being able to contact a patient on your smartphone or tablet and look at their wound, look at their amount of swelling and make recommendations. Um, below you see an example of an ultrasound showing where we do the adductor canal block for our knee replacements. Um, again, I, I would say all of us who ventured into offering outpatient, same day, total knee replacement. Safety was our primary concern and none of us entered into it without the utmost um, sort of concern about was this, is this really gonna work? Is this really gonna be safe for my patients? Because if it's not, we really didn't want to do any of it. Um, so really our overall health of our patient is our major factor. The age, is probably less important because of course, as you all know, we have some really, really healthy 90 year olds and we have some really unhealthy 30 year olds. So probably the physiologic age of the patient matters the most. Certainly the size of the patient can make things more challenging from an anesthetic standpoint and a risk factor standpoint. And then obviously patients that have large risk factors when it comes to heart disease or lung disease, we really wanna prevent them having to go from an outpatient setting to a hospital setting under any duress at all. So we want to try to manage, minimize that. So who, who amongst us is, a, is an outpatient total joint candidate? So you want your shoulder or your hip or your knee replaced and you, you want to go home the same day. So obviously it takes a really highly motivated patient, somebody that is interested in trying to get home as soon as possible. Um, I think it helps to have a really healthy and, uh, and honest understanding of one's pain tolerance. And probably most importantly, along with their health goes, what kind of support system do you have at home? These are big surgeries and you need a good coach. You need a, you need a good family member, spouse, 
um, somebody who's going to help take care of you. And of course, you need a physical environment that's conducive to recovery. Um, if the way into your house is the spiral set of staircase with ice on it, um, total joint probably as an outpatient isn't your best option. Um, more into patient selection. Other factors, some, some patients come to us as surgeons and really want to do this, they're motivated, but they may have other disease where it's just going to be safer to do their surgery in, in, a, in a hospital setting. So do they have significant renal disease? Do they have significant liver disease? Do they have a history of easy clotting or pulmonary embolus where the blood clot goes to their lungs? Do they have significant difficulty with urination or prostate disease? It's going to make it potentially challenging to get them home safely. Um, do they have a significant history of opioid use? This is going to be hard to manage their pain, maybe. Um, are they a high fall risk? Do they have poor balance? Do they have severe visual or hearing difficulties without accommodations that might make it unsafe? Have they had a recent heart attack or stroke? Um, it's interesting when you really review nationwide total knee replacements, there's no set criteria. So there's not one you know, set of guidelines, but we really lean heavily on our anesthesia colleagues and our internal medicine family practice colleagues to make sure that the surgeon is making the right decision with their patient and keeping it safe for the patient. Um, so at, at the center, we have a very comprehensive um, screening process. Of course, this is gonna generally begin with you in the office talking to your surgeon. Um, Lots of us at the center do a variety of joint replacements and a lot of the discussion starts in the office and then it's going to move on to perhaps working with the surgeon's physician assistant. Always the fun part of working with an authorization team and, and the reason I have that in there is unfortunately some patients are motivated, they're healthy and darn it, their insurance won't let them do this. So not everybody is even eligible to do this. Um, that seems to be, again, changing and less of an issue, but it sure was an issue when we first started doing these. Um, we do an extensive screen with a nurse that calls everyone who's a potential candidate. Um, and unfortunately, some people, uh, many people are screened out by this screening process and it can be frustrating for the patient. But again, I hope that anyone who's gone through this, if you're on the webinar tonight, it's again, always been based you know, looking out for the patient's safety and best interest. Um, nowadays, of course, we, we really have to COVID test everybody um, and we need to get medical clearance generally from the patient's primary care physician. Um, and maybe Deb Rogers will probably get some questions about this. She's really championed the phrase of a coach. Um, you can have a Bobby Knight coach, you can have a Tony Dungy coach, but you're gonna need a coach. And one of the risks of having a joint replacement and then getting sent to the hospital is a lack of a support system. So we really want a spouse, a family member, a friend who's willing to be a primary caregiver in the immediate perioperative period. So that coach needs to be physically and mentally capable. I've had some patients you know, suggest their, their, their 12 year old son or daughter could handle this or you know, their, their maybe their elderly and not so physically capable um, partner. Um, people need to be able to help the patient physically, mentally, be able to help with personal hygiene, feeding uh, or getting them food, able to assist in movement, transportation, be able to drive and maybe help them in and out of a car, um, maybe feel comfortable uh, delivering medication when that patient maybe isn't so capable. And a lot of it is providing emotional support. This can be a tough go for several days following a knee or hip replacement. These can be painful operations. And I think most of us would rather be uncomfortable in our own home, maybe in a familiar environment, but we don't want to be, we don't want to be alone. And, and we're going to make sure everybody who has a total joint at the center has a coach. Um, hopefully it's not one throwing a chair at you, but Hopefully it's a good coach. So you're committed to doing a total joint. How do you get prepared? We get this question all the time. Try to exercise. It's hard if, you, if the joint that you're gonna get replaced hurts, but if you can stretch, if you can get used to um, getting out of chairs, off couches, using your arms, riding a stationary bike is a great way to make sure you're ready. Doing a little bit of walking, using resistance bands, um, stretching. Another big one is address other health conditions because boy, when you go through a joint replacement, it's a real 
challenge for patients. If you get a hip or a knee replacement and you've been dealing with a bad back for two or three years and you really haven't addressed it, that can really mess things up during your recovery and challenge you to get a good result. So I encourage all my, all my patients to make sure, get as healthy as you can going in. Um, big one, prepare your physical space. I think all of us in our house have our favorite spot. Mine happens to be in front of TV with ESPN on, but we want to eliminate fall risks. That can be disastrous, especially after hip and knee replacements. So we need to create wide paths. We want to eliminate loose rugs, cords. Um, we want to make sure our bathroom and hygiene areas are safe. So whether or not it's a toilet seat extender, something that doesn't make you get way low, or whether or not it's a shower chair so you won't slip or fall in the shower. Those are gonna be really helpful for patients. Um, Fido, um, I have a big Fido and a small Fido at my house. Both prevent, uh, present some challenges and we all love uh, our four-legged friends, but between and, and their risk of tripping you up following a joint replacement, I really, I encourage my patients to have a plan in place so that they don't feel bad, you know, we want to be good pet owners, but uh, again, we got to take care of ourselves so we can take care of them. So I'm a big believer in making sure Fido is in a, in a good spot. Um, so another thing is some other tips, preparing, preparing your house. So grocery shopping, getting plenty of food in the freezer, or pre-made meals. Um, again, get that, get that comfy spot with the remote control and, and your cell phone and your, your tablets. All these things make life so much easier for you if it's done ahead of time. If you do take other medicines, making sure they're filled so your coach or caregiver doesn't have to run off or call your other doctor's offices to get, get those medications filled. Um, having a thermometer handy so if you do feel like you might be getting ill or having a large or a significant fever after a joint replacement so you can take your temperature. Staying hydrated, plenty of fluids that you like to drink. Um, eating healthy after this is going to be super helpful. Uh, stopping tobacco and nicotine is going to probably limit or reduce your risk of getting an infection. And specifically leading up to joint replacements, try to avoid activities that might damage the skin around the area that's about to be replaced. Um, so what do you, people always wanna know, I, mean, I think all of us wanna know, what, what do we expect the day of surgery? Well, it's all gonna be laid out for you. You're gonna get, you're gonna get these check-ins time and time again, but you're gonna be, you're gonna be asked and instructed how to, how to cleanse the area with antibiotic soap. You'll, you'll have swabs, you'll pick up medication ahead of time. Um, you'll get a check-in time usually the day before surgery. Um, oftentimes these things can um, sort of ebb and flow, but rest assured you're gonna know when you need to be there at least a day uh, in advance. You'll check in, you'll meet the team, uh, specifically at Cascade Surgery Center. Our team of nurses is awesome. They make you feel comfortable right away. Um, they, they will really alleviate a lot of your concerns with, with how the day is gonna go. Um, you'll get an IV placed, which they do really painlessly. Um, you're gonna get some medication, part of that multimodal program. And then you'll meet your anesthesiologist. Sometimes you'll talk to your anesthesiologist ahead of time. Other times you may not have that opportunity, but rest assured they'll answer any questions you have the day of surgery. And then they're gonna go through the process of giving you a nerve block, nerve blocks to make sure you're comfortable during and after the procedure. And then you'll go to the OR where it's nice and cold. And that's where, you know, you'll, you'll meet your surgeon, of course, the day of the surgery, we'll sign your leg, we'll get you back to the operating room. Most of the time, you're not gonna remember a lot of this because of the lovely medicines we can give you. We try to do spinal anesthetics when possible. It's not always possible. Then the leg is very sterilely prepped. We do your knee replacement in this case, uh, hip replacement, shoulder replacement generally one to two hours, one to two and a half hour procedures, and then to the recovery room where you'll have a nurse working with you most of the rest of the day. In the recovery room, you're going to get your vitals monitored. We're going to make sure your pain's under control. We're going to begin early motion and elevation of that limb. You'll have a cold therapy unit specifically for knees and shoulders. Um, and then the fun begins. Uh, the physical therapist comes in and those poor folks, they're great. We have excellent physical therapists come down from upstairs and start working with the patient as soon as they're ready. 
Um, we make sure you're capable of getting to a bathroom with some assistance. We make sure you can eat and drink enough to keep you um, safe at home. Usually another physical therapist, uh, another physical therapy visit to make sure you're okay using the walker safely and perhaps navigating some stairs if you have them at home. Always plenty of time for your loved one or coach to come in. And even with COVID, go over question and answer session. Um, discharge home can be as short as four hours. I should have put four, three to four hours from the start to as long as 10 to 12 hours. And again, we're never, we're gonna keep people as long as we need to, to make sure it's safe and effective. Um, you're gonna get bombarded with phone calls and follow-ups. Uh, we used to see all of our patients, we'd make you come in the next day to see either the surgeon or the physician's assistant who helped out. We did start to discover that that can be a little bit onerous on the coach and the caregiver. So a lot of times we do this with a video chat or a phone call. You're going to get phone calls from the nurses at the surgery center as well. Um, so you're not, you're not hanging out to dry on your own. Um, what's a normal, we get asked this all the time. A lot of questions will probably be about what's a normal recovery. I, I try to encourage patients. Every patient is different. There's no normal recovery. Some people breeze through these operations like they make it look easy and others will really struggle, but long and short of it is you're going to get through it and our patients do well. And I'll share you um, some of our experiences with that. Your discomfort, rest assured, can be managed well in your own home. We're going to focus on early range of motion. We're going to pay homage to vanilla ice back in the eighties. We're going to really, all of us who do knee replacements and shoulders, we're gonna focus on getting that cold therapy going early and often for as long as it takes. We're gonna elevate, we're gonna encourage compression. We're gonna get you to physical therapy. We do encourage a lot of, and I can maybe answer this, a lot of people ask about using a cane or crutches. We want folks using a walker to minimize fall risk and to try to get people walking normally, achieve a normal gait early. Um, we're gonna make sure you're committed to outpatient physical therapy. We're gonna help set that up at, at the outpatient um, surgery center. And we're gonna remind patients to be patient. It, it, it does probably seem to a lot of people who have been through this that it, it can be a big struggle, especially the first two weeks. But in the end, most patients really do get there and get a great result. Um, so we get up, we get moving. We, are, we don't recommend overdoing it. Um, again, we, we really emphasize compression, elevation, the old toes above nose. So we want to get your feet up above heart level. Um, a lot of people report losing a lot of their appetite in those first couple days. We encourage lots of fluids, small meals. Some people get pretty nauseated with the medication. And again, we want to get rid of that as soon as possible. It's very common to be a little depressed. Again, the importance of a coach, family members, your physician, their PA, um, their medical assistants, the nurses at the surgery center. And again, asking for help to avoid falls is gonna be crucial. Um, some average timelines, and I hesitate even mentioning these, but people generally wanna know, you know, I'm gonna be up walking with a walker day zero. I'm hopefully gonna be walking with minimal assistance within the first two weeks. Again, off pain medication, the sooner most patients feel, the better. Um, a lot of people ask about driving. There's no hard, fast rule about driving, but certainly you're gonna have to be off all medication that could alter your ability to drive safely. Um, biking, indoor biking is gonna be used by your physical therapist early and often, and a lot of people get very tired of the bike. Um, people often ask, ask about long car rides and airplane travel, maybe not as much with COVID, but um, we're gonna, I tell my patients, when your physical therapist looks at you and you feel comfortable, I let my patients travel um, oftentimes very early on in this process. Um, activities such as golf, tennis, skiing, all of those are gonna be very patient dependent, but all of those are gonna be allowed and oftentimes encouraged. Uh, a lot of times that's part of the reason why you did the replacement in the first place. Um, so what about specifically in Bend, Oregon, specifically at Cascade Surgery Center? Um, we started looking into a few of us and a lot of our, a lot of our colleagues thought we were crazy, but we looked into total joints as early as 2009, 2010, and we're very interested in providing that option. 
Um, we started developing pathways and protocols and our first outpatient knee replacement was done in October 2015 by Dr. Hall and I did one I think two days later. Um, and then our first total hip was March, as you can see, 2016. Outpatient total shoulder, Dr. Jacobson did that May 2017. And then the Mako robot arrived um, the summer of 2020. And this slide, uh, I didn't update, but we have over 400, whoops, 480 total joints um, that have been completed plus since the um, sort of since the beginning of our program. And proud to report actually only two hospital admissions um, out of 480 plus total joint patients. So I think our, our safety record and our success has been really, um, can be credited to the team downstairs. Um, so with that, hopefully, um, I guess that went a little long. I apologize, maybe have, that's the beauty of a webinar. You can be sleeping and I don't even know. Um, but I think now we could try to get to the question and answer uh, section. And I think Deb Rogers is gonna join us by, at least maybe by audio or video. Um, and, and we can try to scroll, scroll through some of these. Um, uh, one, of, one of my questions up on my screen, uh, Deb, is what does an elective total knee look like due to the pandemic? Um, and Deb knows way more about this than I do. So this would be a great question for Deb to answer. So with the pandemic, um, we had a lot of delays at the hospital, and fortunately at the same time, rules changed with Medicare, and we really had the opportunity to do more patients at the surgery center. So with those two changes, we were able to divert a lot of the patient population that normally would have gone through the hospital to an outpatient surgery center, and Cascade Surgery Center has been helpful to get those patients smoothly through the system during the pandemic. Yeah, was, was, there is a question. There is a question in the chat asking about an active 58 year old man who had arthritis in a cleanup um, at the center last two years and came or more active lifestyle once he gets a joint replacement, such as skiing, backpacking, running, etc. Do you want to address that one? Sure. Yeah, that's a great, um, I think that's a great, uh, it's actually a great question. Um, generally, a couple things about specifically knee replacements. It's interesting, in general, the patients that enter into a knee replacement, and this generally holds true for hip replacements as well, the activity level that you enter a joint replacement with, you will generally exit, hopefully, that joint replacement with, but hopefully with less pain and less discomfort. So uh, we frequently, I'm sure Deb gets this question all the time, patients will come in, they'll say, boy, my knee has really stopped me from skiing the last five years. The studies are pretty clear that in general, a joint replacement isn't likely to let you go back to skiing. But if you're skiing currently and skiing with a lot of pain and a lot of swelling or hiking with a lot of pain or a lot of swelling, that should, in theory, if everything goes well, be improved. I think that's would that, is that generally how you'd answer that as well, Deb? Correct. If they're active before, they tend to be active afterwards. And that's really important to keep the mobility in the joint. It's really important to continue to progress with range of motion and physical therapy. There's a question in the chat about using a continuous motion machine to speed recovery. And the research shows that at six weeks, there's no difference between whether you used a motion machine or not. And using the motion machine can definitely help with early range of motion, but it doesn't help long-term. So we've really gotten away from CPM machines. Boy, it feels like the past six, seven years, we don't use them on a routine basis at all. Yes, I, I mean, back in There's, the day, everybody used to get them and really the data sort of had us drop them. Um, they can be super handy for certain patients who really oftentimes can, if we have a patient that's really struggling or maybe is in a very rural location and doesn't have very, uh, doesn't have excellent access mm -hmm. to therapy, they can be useful. But certainly as Deb said, routinely now, pretty sure across the country, very few people are using them. Um, Correct. There's a, there's a lot of questions in here. I'm trying to use all this 
technological uh, savvy here. Um, a lot of questions about the anesthesia blocks. Um, the how does a knee feel when you have a block and a spinal? Um, again, the the spinal anesthetic will tend to cause uh, numbness, um, lower extremities equally, and that will wear off relatively quickly after your surgery for most patients. The blocks will tend to wear off slowly. We hope they wear off slowly and gently, mm -hmm. so you get time to adjust. And again, the most common finding with a block, you're just going to have the best analogy I can use is when you go to the dentist, really, and that sort of mm -hmm. that feeling that the limb is waking up. Most people do not find it to be uncomfortable. It might feel a little odd, but most people generally do really well with how their blocks wear off, and it gives them time to accommodate and adjust. And the blocks, I would have to add to that, the blocks are so effective that I actually warn patients in the first 48 hours not to overdo it because they're so excited, they don't have any pain and they go and overdo it. And then when that block wears off, they really understand what people were telling them about a knee replacement. So I generally say in the first 48 hours, you know, just because you can do it doesn't mean that you should. Um, somebody has a question. Just to be in cautious. Here. Yeah, uh, there's a question in here about the scar. Um, generally, most people who take really good care of their incisions keep them out of the sun. And again, some people are prone to more scarring than others. Most of the incisions for total shoulders, total knees, and total hips. And Deb, again, correct me if you feel differently, but most of the time they turn out really well. And after three months, six months, a year generally become very small and, and not overly noticeable. Of course, everybody's different and some people mm -hmm. can really form scar. So I think that's a variable that no one can really predict. Um, I'd say that's probably right. the best way to answer that question. Also in the chat box, there's how long do you need to someone to assist you after surgery? And I am probably one of the most conservative here. And I usually say it's, it would be helpful to have someone with you for the first week. Really think about how are you, and this is for a lower extremity, so a hip or knee replacement. And if you're using a walker and you have to walk with a walker, I always say, how would you get a glass of milk from the counter to the dining room table if you're using a walker? And and then after that, you can be on your own more independently, but always have somebody drive you to physical therapy. One of the most important things about physical therapy is taking a pain medication about an hour before you go so that you can work more effectively. And so by taking that pain medication, it helps you in therapy, but you can't get in the car and drive to therapy. I also noticed that um, I, I don't need a Denver Broncos surgical cap uh, either, but it, it, that, that is probably my second favorite team. So I, 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 I apologize for the hair would not be good uh, today. Um, the, one good question in here that we should answer, are you performing uh, joint replacements on individuals who smoke? And I think I can answer this for almost all of my partners it's really, the data is really clear. And, and again, I, this is not a judgment that surgeons are passing. This is really just data driven. The risk of infection and wound healing is so much higher in patients smoking and, and high nicotine exposure that it really becomes more of a patient safety issue. And I think most of us doing joint replacements really emphasize, even if it's for a short period around a joint replacement, we we really encourage folks to try mm -hmm. to stop and it's gonna make their surgery safer and perhaps hopefully a better result. I agree. Yeah. Um, There's they, a lot of questions. Go, go ahead, ahead, Tim. No, no, go ahead. There's a lot of questions about physical therapy and obtaining range of motion. Um, physical therapy for total needs, we have you get started right away. For a hip replacement, you don't have to have formal physical therapy. So we have you get started with physical therapy on a knee right away, get that going, get started. Our general guideline for a range of motion for physical therapy is getting it fully straight to at least 120. That's what you need to have in order to be functional. 
And your physical therapist helps guide you through those exercises. And the key is really being consistent with range of motion. Ice and elevation, range of motion. Those are the biggest things that you want to work on. Yeah, well said. A um, couple other ones I think we can go through quickly for folks. Um, estimated length of a knee replacement, and then people have also asked, one or two folks look like they're wondering how long an average knee replacement will last. Knee replacement surgery, the surgery itself, probably somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour and a half to two hours. And then the lifespan of a knee replacement really depends on a huge host of factors, patient weight, size, how they use it. But in general, we're hoping that knee replacements that we put in today will last 15, 20, 25, 30 years or more. Mm -hmm. um, and again, highly variable, of course. There's also some questions about spinal anesthesia and are you asleep during the procedure? There was a comment that, is it similar to a colonoscopy? That's kind of the same thing. When you um, go into surgery, you often don't realize you're going into surgery. And the next thing you know, you're in recovery room. And it goes, it feels like it goes that quickly. You don't wake up during surgery. The, the anesthesiologists are excellent about monitoring you the entire time. And so that's one of the issues we don't worry about after sur with surgery. Yeah, um, a lot of uh, uh, another question about how many days of icing. I, I tell my patients, and I could be very conservative on the ice issue, but I, to me, if there's one way to get your swelling down after a knee replacement, and I, I know Scott Jacobson feels that way about shoulders, uh, we're big believers of ice, and I, I, the patients that ice consistently and do so for weeks, I just think they do way better than the folks that do it a few days and kind of get off it. So I, I, I think all of us who do knee and shoulders um, really emphasize the ice part of that. Um, another question about use of um, the drugs we use, can they cause urinary retention and constipation? And sure, that's, that's one of the biggest concerns we had about developing a program. So all of the medicines you're gonna get when you do an outpatient total joint can cause some of those, but we really try to minimize them because that is one of our biggest concerns by far. Correct. There's also a question, a lot of questions around ACL injuries, previous ACL reconstruction. I would have to say sometimes an ACL uh, injury is kind of what sets off arthritis in the future. So this is something that surgeons work around all the time. They're constantly working around um, previous ligament injuries, previous ligament reconstruction, and they deal with that all the time. There's a question here about, do you need to get a COVID test if you have been vaccinated? And we are definitely in a pandemic and you do, every patient that comes into the hospital or into the Cascade Surgery Center needs to get a COVID test regardless of vaccination at this time. This is one that I get asked all the time, and Deb, I'd be curious to hear what you tell uh, folks when you're working with them. Um, we oftentimes get asked about kneeling after a knee replacement. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting, there's a lot that goes into that. I tell my patients they can kneel. I will not tell them not to kneel, but a large mm -hmm. number of knee replacement patients after they get their knee replaced feel as if they have a hard time kneeling. It feels odd. It feels uncomfortable. So they don't kneel. So Deb, do you have any, mm -hmm. any other tips or, you know, that's sort of always been my response. I, I agree. And I usually say, you know, don't um, work on your knee a lot. You won't like it. It won't feel well. There's quite a few people in Central Oregon that are gardeners. So I always recommend getting a thick pad and placing it on your shin, not so that you're kneeling on it, but that your knee is actually hanging off the edge of the pad and you're bearing the most weight on your shin bone. That actually helps um, relieve some of the pressure that you would feel on your knee. Well, I, you know, it's, it's almost seven o'clock. I, Deb, are there any other, I mean, there's a lot of, there, I think, a lot of these we've, I think hopefully we've gotten to most of these. 
There's, mm -hmm. there's some more very specific, there are a couple of real specific questions in there with specific uh, medical um, conditions. And I think I, I would mm -hmm. maybe keep it more general tonight and encourage folks when it comes to specific medical issues to really speak to your surgeon because I'd hate to have a different opinion than your surgeon. And, and so I think I'd, mm -hmm. I'll probably defer those and I apologize if I'm not getting to those. Um, there's something in here I'd mentioned non-cemented knee replacement, uh, hip replacements, that's a, also an issue and also shoulders. Um, traditionally, uh, going way back, we would put metal into bone and it would stay there because of cement. We don't have to necessarily use cement. Bone will grow into properly coated metal. And so that's really what non-cemented means in case some of you are wondering about that. That made its way through a question. Mm -hmm. I agree. There's a just one little one to address. When do you know? There's a lot of questions around when do you need know it's time for a joint replacement. A joint replacement is always considered an elective procedure. And so by ensuring standards, that's an elective procedure. It's really up to you and how you are moving. The insurance company typically, want, typically wants to see that you've tried conservative measures, injections, anti-inflammatory, weight reduction, physical therapy. Um, but when, once you've tried those, it comes down to a decision between you and your surgeon. This is really a time where it's up to you to make up your mind when you're ready to have surgery. The surgeon can look at multiple x-rays throughout the day, but that's not seeing what the patient's going through. There's often times where we see x-rays that look horrible and the patient's actually doing reasonably well, sometimes surprisingly well. And other times we'll see x-rays that don't look that bad and the patient's really struggling. So it's really how you're feeling and how you're progressing with your activities of daily living. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. I think it's, you wanna try all reasonable conservative measures and then really let your quality of life determine when you're ready. Obviously th that's gonna change and Deb would say this, um, and we see more and more of this. When you're very, very young, uh, whatever that means nowadays, mm -hmm. right? young is relative now <laughs> for me, um, but the obviously joint replacements only last X amount of time. So the younger you are on that spectrum, People oftentimes, sometimes I think get frustrated with their surgeons and I, I can sometimes get second and third opinions from patients who will say, well, my surgeon won't replace my joint. Well, when you're very, very young, there's only so much bone we have to work with in all of these joints. So if you have a joint replacement and you wear it out, then we have to do it again or try to do it again. That's more difficult. So one of the reasons we don't jump to joint replacements when you're younger is we really wanna preserve your limb and the bone in that limb. So we have something to work with as you get older. So that is of course why we do encourage the younger the patient, hopefully we really encourage the non-surgical treatments first. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's probably, past, uh, probably past everybody's bedtime, <laughs> no, or my bedtime. Um, the, uh, we're certain Deb and I are certainly will try to answer all these questions in, in any other formats. Um, obviously, many of you have different surgeons and PAs at the center who are going to be trying to answer any other questions. And um, the medical assistants are great. And Deb is an amazing resource. Again, I want to thank mm -hmm. Jamie Briggs. She did a she's a star uh, trying to edu help us educate patients and try to get content out there to you folks who are interested. Um, I think our website has our website has dramatically improved over the last 20 years to the point that the stuff we have on there, I think is great for patients. And I encourage all my patients to use it um, as much as you can. So check out the website and the content. My, a lot of my partners have great webinars on there. Dr. Urch has a great one. Dr. Lilly has uh, one or two of them on there. So um, really good stuff. And if you're ever bored and you can't sleep, it's great. I mean, Go online and learn more about. Oh, it's uh, better than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, with that, I think I don't know if uh, if Jamie has anything else to add, but we'll sign off. And thank you all for joining us. I hope it wasn't um, too long or too too simple or complex for that matter. And 
your, your, your surgeon or provider at the center is going to be a, a, a wealth of information if we didn't cover something you had hoped we would tonight. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Thank night. You.